Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to another episode of the Drachmas and Denarii podcast. I'm your host, as always, Sam, and I'm joined today by Antoine. Antoine, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Sam. Thank you uh, for having me here today. How are you? Good, thanks. Yeah, thanks for coming on. It's been a busy summer for me. I uh, have an internship out of town, so that's part of the reason why it's been, I think, a couple months since the last time we uploaded a video on the channel. But I'm happy that we can get together here and get a video put out. Sounds like fun. Congrats with that. And yeah, it's great to be here and it's great to do this. Absolutely. Yeah, this looks like a pretty nice sale. I mean, Loy has been on fire recently. I mean, they're pretty much putting 5,000 coin sales back to back to back in the last couple months. I mean, I've been really impressed just by the throughput and the volume of what they're putting out here in the market. Yeah, I don't know how they do it. 5,000 sales every two or three months, or 5,000 coins, sorry. It's a lot. <laughs> it's yeah, quite it's, a lot. And it seems like yeah, this was a pretty good sale overall in terms of just me looking through. I found a lot of targets that I'm interested in. So I was just impressed that not only does Loy have that quantity, but they tend to also hit on the quality side of it. I think it was certainly, it certainly would have been a good sale for you. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it was, it's a very good sale, but it tends to skew a bit more late antiquity or medieval, I think, from what I've seen, uh, that which could is be, definitely yeah. good for me. It's a, it's a nice <laughs> mixture. Yeah. <laughs> We can go ahead and get started here. So I've got the lots roughly in chronological order of the date they were minted in. So we should, should see a good mix here between Greek to Roman to Byzantine to some medieval. And so it looks like our first lot here is from the Kings of Macedon, Perseus 179 to 168 BC. It is a drachim, uh, a pseudo Rhodian issue. And I must say it's got some nice style. Yeah, so this one, this issue, um, from my recollection, it was made during one of the campaigns of Philip, I'm trying to remember who it was against, maybe the Aetolian League, possibly the Romans. And it's interesting because they enlisted primarily Rhodian mercenaries, or at least a significant core of Rhodians into their army. And so to keep things feeling... I guess feeling like they would have back home, they made these coins in the style of what those people would have been used to back in Rhodes. So that's why you get a very significant departure from the classic Macedonian design with either Athena or Apollo on the reverse and then usually a portrait of the king on the obverse. So you get Helios here and then on the reverse we've got yeah, the classic Rose for Rhodes. Yeah, that's an interesting point you make there. That's a trend you see across a lot of ancient coin denominations that when a group hires mercenaries, they tend to feature the, the elements that those mercenaries would have seen in their hometown or home city. I know aren't a lot of the Punic coins like that where the mercenaries that were brought in were used to Syracusan design, so they imported those. I could be wrong on that, but I, I thought I heard that somewhere in the, the Syracusan line that a lot of those designs were kept due to mercenaries accepting them. No, you're absolutely right. Um, yeah, they copied a lot of the Syracusan designs. And then later on, whether it was people that came west after the conquest of Alexander or just to sort of compete with the sort of standardized system Alexander set, they also copied those designs. So they did have a significant uh, throughput of Heracles obverses as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, and this specimen has got some nice toning. I was about to say, I wonder if it has some provenance with that sort of old old collection, old cabinet toning it has, but it seems like down here at the bottom, they say it goes back to at least 1972, which is pretty impressive. I mean, a lot of coins you don't even see back to 2010, but I think for the most part, this Loy sale is from the collection of Mr. Sternberg. And I think that most of his coins are provenance pretty far back. Yeah, I think or, this oops, is all uh, one Mr. collector's. Not, not Sternberg, oh, yeah. that was my bad. Mr. Uh, uh, Blashag there. I think that is his sale, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think you're right. And it's a pretty impressive collection, too. He's pieced together something like 2,500 coins. Very Quite impressive well. provenances. I respect that from a collector, that they're able to enjoy you know, ancient Greek, Roman, Byzantine, medieval, even some modern, too. I personally, I don't. my collection isn't that diverse in terms of eras, but... I respect that and think it's quite impressive too when you not only collect so many different eras but are able to put together such a nice collection. It shows that, uh, number one, they had a lot of time, and number two, more importantly, they must have had a lot of money. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think it also shows that probably betrays a sense of that collecting for the history that a lot of us have. So clearly, it's not just a cohesive set for one era or one um, theme, but he's got a lot of everything. There's papal coins I came across, there's Sicilian coinage, Byzantine, Greek, Roman. It's just, it's a great selection. Must yeah, have really enjoyed it. You could define this collection by the word continuity. I mean, he's really collecting a certain group of people or a certain city or civilization and kind of going back to back to back. With what I would say is just a straight line of coinage, which is pretty neat, pretty neat, pretty nice to see. And this one is currently at 250 francs. And I don't know about francs. I know the euro is down right now in comparison to the, the dollar. Do you know, are francs also affected by that? I wonder if we're going to see increased American bidding due to currency fluctuations. Um, I think at the moment, I think the franc is holding parity with the USD. Um, it's kind of trash for me being on the other side of the world regardless. Every yeah. currency is a bit of a pain to convert into. Yeah, I think dollars, the franc is holding just strong. Just not the right one. <laughs> <laughs> just not the right kind. That's right. Well, yeah, we can go and head on to the next lot here. So next up, we've got a beautiful coin, lot 47 from uh, Cilicia or Calicia Tarsus. I'm not sure how to pronounce that satrap. I'll go with the the more friendly spelling there. Datames? Is that how you pronounce that? Yeah, so I've always pronounced it Datames, and I think okay. the um the Aramaic version or the the uh, more eastern version is Turkumwa, but it's a it's a bit of a tough one. I will give you that absolutely. Well, either way, he certainly knew how to mint a beautiful coin. This says it was minted between 384 and 361 BC. It is a silver stator coming in at 10.75 grams and 21 millimeters. And I've got to say, I love that reverse. That's such a crisp strike right there. It's got a lot of lots of lovely toning. It really is an impressive piece. Yeah, this one is absolutely lovely. The reverse is that's about as good as it gets. Honestly, it's nearly perfect. Um, I'm actually glad that you brought up the fact that he made a beautiful coin because technically he didn't come up with this design. It was his predecessor, Farnabazus. So the history behind these is fairly interesting, actually. It starts off with the Persians wanting to recapture Egypt after the Egyptians' revolt. So this would be the Achaemenid Empire. Mm -hmm. um, so the Egyptians revolted, I think, sometime around 380 or 390. They gained their, regained their independence. And the Persians, obviously, they've held Egypt for over a century at this point, so they want to take it back. So Farnabazus was someone high up in the Persian aristocratic echelon at that point. So he got sent over by the king, the emperor, to Calicia, and he was tasked with putting together an army for an invasion of Egypt to conquer it back. Um, I believe he sent out his invasion force in 373 or 374 BC and for whatever reason I think it was a combination of poor planning and poor weather they weren't really able to make it I think even as far as Memphis let alone anywhere further than that so it was a failed invasion he came back and I'm not sure if he died during the invasion or if he was simply relieved of command but at that point you have de Thomas who steps into the void there. He's also from the Persian um, nobility. And at this point, the only change he institutes on the coins at the start is he switches out the name on the reverse next to the, the male figure, whether it's Ares or a mercenary, there's still some debate who it is, but he switches out the name and it's in Aramaic, which was the lingua franca of the lingua franca, sorry of the east at that time, the Phoenician coastline. So he switches it out and he puts his name on and he keeps things going as they were for another invasion. But that invasion never ends up happening because he decides one day around 369, 370, that he would rather be his own king. <laughs> so he gets together all the other satraps that are around him in Asia Minor and they rebel en masse. And that takes almost a decade to put down, which is actually, I think it's a significant driver of the the opportunity that presents itself later on to Philip. But yeah, it's certainly an interesting piece. And so um, with coinage like this, I know when Alexander the Great comes and conquers the area, you sort of lose a lot of the variety in local issues. 
Was that the case here with Cilicia and Tarsus? Because, I mean, it, it seems like once Alexander comes over, he introduces the standardized coin of the Heracles obverse and the Seed and Zeus reverse. And so all these sort of independent issues go away at that point. I'm not sure if I'm correct in that, but is this an issue that sort of falls under that umbrella of a local v issue with variety before Alexander that sort of becomes monotonous afterwards? Um, well, it's an interesting point because I can't speak to the Tarsus Mint specifically, but I do know that a lot of the mints, um, they quickly switched, like after Alexander's death, they pumped out Alexander type coins for a while, but most of them afterwards came under the purview of either Ptolemy or Seleucus, and at that point they switched to designs for those dynasties. So it was relatively short-lived in the east i think i think in certain um black sea coastline cities and places that were a bit more removed from the epicenter of what was going on politically you definitely did get alexander types taking over and being struck for another 200 odd years but i think in a place like tarsus you actually had the alexander types only there as something of a short blip roughly equivalent to these other local variants so you would have had these were made this is a very short-lived issue in comparison it's there's quite a few of them out there because i'd assume a horde has been found recently and they were made for mercenaries so they would have been made in mass but it was only made for roughly two or three years before it switched to um the revolt types of which there's at least two potentially more um, and then you get, yeah, you get Matsayos comes in after the revolt is quelled, and he has a very extensive issue of the lion bull type and the bull and lion over the gates of the city, whether it's Jerusalem or Tarsus, there's some debate there, and there's a few other types that he has. Um, then you get the Alexander types, but then I think you get into the Seleucid era pretty quickly as well. So they're only short-lived. I think it's only another 20 or 30 years of Alexander types. And then you get the fairly regular switching over of dynastic types under the Seleucids. So I do think, yeah, you lose a little bit of that individual character, but the Alexander issues in particular don't take over. I think it's more just the larger political shift to these big homogenous kingdoms in the area instead of the local autonomy that the satraps had adjoined, enjoyed under the Achaemenids. I think that's the shift we see. Post Alexander. Awesome. Yeah, that helps a lot. Thank you for that insight. That was very detailed. I appreciate that. And I must ask too, you mentioned in the beginning with the reverse being either a mercenary or Ares. Do you know what the arguments for either side are? And which way do you lean in that? Uh, it's a good one. It's um, I, The argument is really the same argument. Because they were made for um, mercenaries, because it was made for a campaign, and it was made primarily for Greek mercenaries from the Greek mainland and the surrounding cities of the Ionian coast, not too far away from Tarsus. Um, it really could have been either. I think it's very tough to say. Generally, human beings weren't put on coins, especially not this early in the game. So I think it is more likely that it would be Ares, and it would have been something familiar for the mercenaries, almost like a, um, I guess like a good luck charm. Like here's a little image of Ares that you have in your pocket with you as you go off to war, that sort of thing. That makes sense, yeah, especially within the context of human beings on coins. I know there's a lot of debate even later with Alexander on his types, whether or not that is him or Heracles, but I think in general it's almost, in my opinion, impossible to make that case. I think it really is just Heracles. I mean, unless you go into those later issues, but at least for the, the initial mintage there, the output, I don't think it is really to those later uh, um, individual successor kingdoms that you really see people put on coins. Yeah, I would agree with you there. It's not really until Alexander dies that he or anyone else makes their way onto a coin. And so for this example here, I mean, it is very nice, but I see the current bid is already at 750 francs, and that's just about two weeks out. Uh, I mean, just as someone who's not too familiar with the era, that seems like a lot of money for these coins because they are relatively common. Is this a case of a very nice example that therefore commands a premium or something that's already overpriced? Um, well, I guess it's really a matter of what the buyer is looking for. This example does say it's provenance to 1963, which if there's a way to verify that, either a purchase ticket, a catalog, something else that could prove that date, 
then it would be a fairly valuable provenance to have. It's pre-UNESCO, it's not a hoard coin, or at least not a recent hoard coin. So that definitely puts it in a class of its own there. If that was something the buyer was worried about or which impacted their ability to import it to wherever they live. Um, it is a really nice example, actually, on the obverse as well. Usually you have some doubling in the face. You've got smudged eyes or smudged lips or something. There's a bit of that softness in the lower around five to eight o'clock on the neck here and a bit of the hair. But other than that, it's a very nice face. Um, so it's definitely above average, even with the coins that have been coming out recently of this type. I'd say it's probably not unreasonable for it to go for double what it's at right now, potentially triple. Uh, that wouldn't be too much, honestly, if someone valued the provenance and they wanted an example that was a cut above the rest. Um, and the other thing is, just quickly to touch on, the design of the obverse here is actually that's postulated to be uh, based on the facing head Arethusas ah. from Syracuse. So that's another thing that would have been, it's again, it's like the Syracusan coins being copied by the Carthaginians in roughly the same era. So Syri or, uh, Cilician mercenaries in this time might have been um, potentially one of the groups being recruited. And so that would have been another um, way of putting them at ease, giving them a taste of home possibly. Yeah, that, that's quite an interesting insight for an interesting coin. And now that you mentioned with the provenance too, I think that's a good point. Once you sort of pair an old provenance, if it can be proven with a very nice coin, I think the sky's almost a limit there. That sort of brings out the big shark, so to speak, those large bidders. And yeah, I'll be curious to see what this hammer's for. And we can go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Sometimes it, it brings out some very strong bids <laughs> at times. Yeah, I'll be curious what this goes for. We can go ahead and move on to our next slot as well. But yeah, that's a great coin and some nice history right there behind it. And so next up, we've got lot 113. This is a Poten Tetradram from Egypt, minted in Alexandria with Aurelian and interesting Vabalthesis. Vabalth I'm not sure if I said that right. Vabalthesis, I think that's right. Close enough. Vabalathus, okay, yeah, you're close, go. you're good. <laughs> you're doing fine. <laughs> Yeah, I know these are quite popular with collectors. I'm assuming with um, Aurelian and his counterpart there that it'll be a lot more expensive since he's a rare ruler, but I know the um, the cheaper later Roman imperial coins from the crisis where you have people like Probus, those coins go for pretty cheap. And I think even on eBay you can get some of these tetradrams for five, ten dollars But I'm going to imagine this will go for a lot more with the counterpart there. And yeah, a 50 franc starting bid. Yeah, I think usually, especially in this condition, that would be that would already be a high hammer if this was, say, a Probus or a Claudius Gothicus or a Gallienus. Um, even as an Aurelian, it wouldn't have been that, yeah, it wouldn't have likely gone higher than that for the hammer. But it really is, yeah, the Vabalathus portrait on the reverse here that seals the deal. Um, I think what really draws people to this is just the the sort of the way it puts the crisis of the third century into perspective you have rome which is this massive unconquerable unshakable entity for the past 600 years at this point certainly for the last 250 to 300 years at this point it has been absolutely unstoppable a juggernaut in control of the entire eastern or western half of the old world right and then you have over the course of it's barely 20 years, you have it fracture so completely that a third of the empire in the northwest and then another third across the east just splits off and becomes their own separate kingdoms for almost two decades. And then it's this amazing golden age, as Gibbon calls it, under Aurelian, where every day was this wonderful, shining golden age that you have Aurelian come back and piece it all together very quickly in the span of, he only ruled for six years and he managed to piece the empire together in roughly three or four of those years, put up new walls around Rome, all of this incredible stuff. Yeah, quite. Um, I think you'd have to look all the way to the Byzantine empire to even find anything comparable. When the Arabs first attacked and shattered Byzantium, a similar story where you had a mega superpower that was 
pretty much the big kid on the block, the large empire for a couple hundred years. And within maybe a decade or two, they've lost half their holdings and just kind of their internal spirit is crushed by all these outside events. Yeah, absolutely. That's like, a very good parallel. I guess I'd with say. Rome, they ended up getting everything back together and Byzantium, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I guess lightning doesn't strike twice, unfortunately. Unfortunately for the Romans, at least. And so I think this is pretty interesting, too. I know that part of the reason with uh, Vibalathus, his downfall, I, I probably mispronounced that, but whatever. Vibalathus, his downfall was that he sort of took on an increasingly imperial role due to his mother, Zenobia. Uh, I don't, was this seen as a peace gesture at the time, or had this been offensive with him depicted as an imperial person with Aurelian on a coin? Would this have been seen more of a like a peace overture towards Aurelian or as an indication of increasing power gains and claims of authority? So it's a tough one because Odonathus, his father and Zenobia's husband, when he'd come to power and created the de facto Palmyrene Empire, he was still a citizen of Rome and he was still acting on the orders of Gallienus officially as protector in the east. He was protecting against the incursions of Shapur and the uh, Sasanians. So it was technically still a part of Rome. Then after his death, which I believe was around 268 or 269, so roughly around the time of just before the ascension of Aurelian, Zenobia steps in and she takes on quite a bit of autonomy. And I'm not 100%, but I think she takes the title of queen or she at least institutes the title of king for her son. I think she so does, it's definitely yeah. a challenge to the power of the Romans in the region, because now it's everybody knows that there's this de facto Palmyrene kingdom, but now it's putting, I guess it's just putting it on paper, making it official, which was a bridge too far for the Romans to actually have someone declare that this wasn't a part of their territory anymore. And yeah, absolutely. The coin here, I think it was something of a provocative gesture at this point to have Vabolathus's portrait on it, because even at Alexandria during the reign of Gallienus, it was just his own portrait that was minted. So to have both of them as co-rulers, I think it was a signal of legitimacy for the Palmyrenes at the expense of the Romans, mm -hmm. which would have probably served to incense Aurelian, I'm assuming. And do you know how rare these coins are? I don't see anything in the description talking about rareness, but I assume they're pretty scarce. I, I've not seen one before, but I don't necessarily look at this era too often either. I haven't been looking too hard, but I think they are on the rare side, especially as Alexandrian Tetradrach may go. Um, yeah, you don't see them too often, but they're definitely not impossible to find if you are after one. It just take maybe a few weeks or a couple months of waiting. I think it's interesting too, if you look at the busts here, I mean the style I'd say in general at this point in the Empire is pretty crude. You lose that artistic merit that you once had, but you can tell between the busts of Aurelian and Vibalathus that there's a difference in youth and age. If you look at Aurelian, I think he quite clearly has a more dignified and older bust, whereas you can see the youth in his imperial counterpart there on the right. Yeah, absolutely, and I think Part of the reason for that is that obviously Vibalathus, I think at this point was something like 15 years old. He was he was quite young and Aurelian was somewhere in his 50s. So obviously that shows with the beard, with the more sort of scowling, droopy jowls, everything. But also I think it sort of speaks to the political sense of the senior and the junior Augusti, which is at least something that you see later with the tetrarchy under Diocletian. So you have the senior Augustus and he's shown as being a bit older, a bit more wizened. And then you have the juniors, whether or not they're actually the same age or not doesn't matter, but they're junior in power. And so you have them represented as being a bit more young, a bit less, um, I guess, martial or just more less powerful in their imagery. Yeah, I think overall, quite the nice issue with a lot of history there and details. And yeah, I think, I don't know the prices too well, but I would say starting and close to, it seems like a very fair price to me, considering that the very common issues might go for 20, 30 francs in this state. And this seems to be a lot rare and it has a lot more history behind it. Plus that nice provenance, if it can be proven. Back to 1973.
But yeah, either way, a very interesting coin. We can go ahead and check out our next lot here. We've got lot 145 from Cassius Longinus, 55 BC. It is a denarius coming in at 19 millimeters and 4 grams, minted in the city of Rome. And so this issue, I guess, predates then the Imperator period by about five years here. So this would have been a tumultuous time in Rome, but just before the outbreak of civil war. Uh, are there any sort of indications of the turmoil of the era in this issue? Um, yeah, so this would have been a very interesting time to be alive and to be a wealthy Roman citizen. It would have been, yeah, a very dangerous time or soon to be dangerous, but also a very interesting historical time. And the sky really would have been the limit very soon after this was made in terms of your political ambitions and where you could get. Um, so this Cassius actually, Quintus Cassius, uh, my memory is a little spotty here, but he was either the brother or the cousin of um the cassius mm -hmm. who was co-conspirator with brutus and helped to murder caesar and then undertook the whole war of the liberatores against uh, mark antony and octavian online says so yeah the cousin or brother i guess there's not really a firm consensus in what i can find at a quick glance yeah i believe there were three cassii so you have quintus lucius and I am blanking on the third one, but there are three of them. And yeah, one of them is the Cassius, and then one of them was definitely his brother, but I don't think we know who. And then the other one was most likely a cousin. Yeah, and this says that he was a governor in Hispania, and also a money year in Rome, and served as the quaestor of Pompey in Hispania, Hispania in 54 BC. That's pretty interesting. But it says also that in 49 BC, as a tribune of the people, he supported the cause of Caesar. It's quite an interesting change in sides. Yeah, well, there was quite a lot of flip-flopping because initially it was a war of Pompey versus Caesar. So there were obviously many of the Pompeians ended up being on the side of the Liberatores, the historical Optimates. But during the, um, the short interim period after Caesar defeated Pompey and came back triumphant and as dictator, many of these men... Part of it was they were pardoned by Caesar, and he was quite magnanimous with his public displays of um, forgiveness. But another part of it was that was just the way to survive, regardless what you felt inside. And then when they were given a chance, again, there was a new conspiracy and a new opportunity to express their political beliefs and to try and achieve their ambitions. So many of them flipped back and chose um, to join in with the conspiracy. Not in 49. That would have been in 45 and 44 as it got drew closer many of them as they felt more secure in their positions and the conspiracy took hold they would have flipped back again and shown their true colors i guess as it were yeah i think a lot of those people maybe were just out for themselves especially if you're a, a lower rung figure you know you just gotta watch out for yourself and your family it doesn't really matter who wins as long as you're alive not prescribed <laughs> you got your head on your shoulders maybe a bit of money too that's exactly it. Yeah, it's today it's Caesar, tomorrow it's Pompey, it's Caesar the next day, and then it's Cassius. There's just, there's no winning if you stick to one side and stick by them to the end. It's, yeah, it would have been very tough to keep your head all the way through into the Principate. And this is an interesting coin in that it depicts architecture. I love when you see that on ancient coins, and sadly, it's not on too many uh, issues, but you see here we've got the Temple of Vesta, which is quite interesting. I'm not sure how many temples of Rome were depicted on coins, but I think just about all of them, correct? I know even the Colosseum and Circus Maximus on some rare issues, you can find those as well. Um, I actually don't know the answer to that question. That's a good question. Uh, you see architecture more in the imperial period, absolutely. You see every time there's a new aqueduct or an amphitheater or a column or something being erected, it gets put on a coin. A bridge across the Danube, put it on a coin, right? Um, with the Republic, I'm trying to think, there's not too many instances. I know you get the uh, rostra in front of the Senate, you get the House of the Senate itself, you get the uh, Basilica built by the family of Lepidus, um, the Emilii, you have this, which is the Temple of Vesta, I believe you have the Temple of Saturn or the Temple of Jupiter as well, but it is, yeah, it's a relatively limited 
group for the Republic, and then, yeah, it explodes exponentially into the Principate and the Imperial as the propaganda value skyrockets, essentially. Oh, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> uh, it's all good. <laughs> I was going to ask with the Curule chair right there. I know that's a symbol of power in uh, Imperial Rome. Do you know, was this reverse here to signify the power of Cassius himself or the Republic as a whole? Um, so I actually don't know how the Curule chair correlates with the Temple of Vesta. I'm actually not entirely sure. Uh, generally speaking, yeah, it was... It was the chair, as far as I understand, that the consuls would sit on. So it was the chair that you'd have at the front of the Senate House for the consuls to sit upon. Um, as far as this reverse goes, it's actually, and this speaks to the the way that moneyers used coins in the Republic, the late Republic, especially from roughly 100 BC on until the Imperatorial Era. They used coins to try and play up their own individual families and the achievements of their ancestors, especially since they wouldn't have had any achievements of their own. Moneyer was basically the first rung on the ladder if that was the route you chose on the Cursus Honorum. So it was usually like a 20-something-year-old young lad, one of a few guys that had been chosen to just keep track of the money, make sure the right alloys are made, the right amount of coins are made. So it was a very entry-level position. But if you had vibrant ancestors, you'd want to play up how great your family was on the designs as you got to choose what designs were made in this late Republican period. So in this case, it was an ancestor of the Cassii um, who actually prosecuted, I believe it was a very public trial of a few Vestal virgins who had broken their vows. Mm. So they were from powerful families. They were originally acquitted, but it was a very big public scandal because keeping to your vows at that time was akin to a national security, um, I guess an item on the national security agenda. Like if you broke your vows, that's it. Vesta is going to ruin the harvest. Rome is going to go under. There's going to be famine. Everything's over. You have to be punished or else, right? The Need Republic will the crumble. Department of Homeland Security. Get them on this. <laughs> yeah, it's like it was worse than a plague of locusts. You might as well have just set them loose yourself, right? Um, so yeah, it was a very serious thing in the Roman religion, and obviously you can look into how absolutely insane it is to bury people alive for breaking that sort of a vow, especially young girls and the like extreme misogyny of that and everything. But within the framework of their society and their religion and their culture, that was, I guess, the way it was done. Um, and so these... Compare, like to the Carthaginians, I'd say as cruel as all that is, it beats sacrificing small children. Oh, absolutely. And again, that's one of those ones where it's we're not 100% certain if it did happen that way. But yeah, there were quite a few insane things that happened in antiquity that were just a normal thing for those cultures that today we would look at and just be absolutely abhorred. Yeah, going through the British Museum, the ancient Near East section, it's pretty crazy what the Assyrians did. And they were proud of it, too. They put it on their release and depictions, but they would impale people alive, rip them apart pretty much the most cruel tortures you can think of they would do just with terror they could keep power and I think that was a, a rule a lot in antiquity that might makes right and through power you can rule you just got to make sure your subjects stay scared yeah that's a hundred percent on the money I'd say yeah it was not a very forgiving world if you weren't rich and powerful yourself not a forgiving world but this price right now seems pretty forgiving I see it's only at 240 francs that seems pretty cheap for a uh, Roman Republican issue a denarius in good condition. I'd say a relatively good strike and an interesting reverse. Uh, yeah, well, I guess we're still two weeks out, so there's there's definitely room for that to change. Um, probably double that would be a pretty good price. I could see it going for triple quite easily because it's a very clear reverse. You get everything there, the Temple of Vesta, the chair inside. 
you actually get the AC. So that's what um, the ancestor of the Cassii, he prosecuted the retrial of those same Vestal Virgins and he got them convicted of their charges because it was this whole scandal that they'd publicly broken their vows and everybody knew about it, but they were being protected by their family. So he managed to convince, um, like he managed to convict them in the new trial, the retrial, and have them, you know, basically punished quite cruelly. But that's what this represents. There's the voting urn, and then on the left, and then on the right, you have the AC on the tablet. So absolvo condemno. So uh, acquitted and found guilty, condemned. So he found them condemned in the end, at the end of his trial. Yeah, I'm surprised Lloyd didn't point that out. There's a great history behind this coin. But I guess with the Roman Republican, there's so many coin types like this, you probably don't have the time to put a write-up with every single one. Yeah, they've been putting in quite a bit of work, pumping out 4,000 coins, and yeah, Roman Republican, just about every coin has a story like this to it, at yeah. least in the late Republic. Yeah, but that's a great coin and still a great price, too. Maybe someone in our audience gets that cheap. We can go ahead and move on to the next lot here. So this is, I think, our last lot before the Byzantine, and this is from Sicily, Italy. You've got Roger II, or Ruggiero II. Uh, and he ruled from 1130 until 1154. And so this would have been a tumultuous time in Sicilian history where I know it was once a Byzantine territory, I think up until the 800s, I think 840 or 850, it fell to the Arabs. And then I know the Normans came back through um, at certain points in time, had it conquered and then had lost it again. So I know, I'm not sure where exactly this falls during that era, but seeing the reverse here, we got the Christian cross I C X E Nika, so Jesus Christ conquers with an Arabic obverse. So you can tell that whoever issued this is a Christian authority, but they're appealing to their local subjects by using a language they would understand and be familiar with. Yeah, this is the last um, the last one that I am going to be talking about at length because I'm not very well versed with the Byzantine ones. I'm sure you're going to share, mm -hmm. but for this one. It's, I think it's just a very cool piece that shows the intersectionality of culture and religion in Europe, even at that time. And we live in a very polarized world today. There's, you know, especially post 9-11 and post, I guess, Trump as well. It's been very polarized recently. But this just shows how people have always, people and culture and religion and language have coexisted um, across the world and especially in the Mediterranean region for thousands of years basically as long as there have been people there they have found ways to coexist and coexist peacefully um and i just really like how that's shown here so yeah as you mentioned sicily yeah it was a byzantine territory until well after the initial arab conquests of north africa and spain then around yeah sometime before 900 it became an arab territory it became the emirate of sicily and palermo ended up being one of the biggest cities in all of europe at the time, one of the wealthiest as well. It was rivaling Cairo in North Africa and Constantinople and Cordoba. Um, and most of the population of Sicily, I believe, well into the 1200s was Muslim. And yeah, as you mentioned, you have the Normans. So obviously that's the Vikings. That's the same people as William the Conqueror, William of Normandy, who were Vikings before that, before they settled in France and England. So you have these same people coming across the Mediterranean and here you have them um, taking over the island of Sicily. That's very interesting. They come in and they bring their own culture, obviously, but they're also, and this was um, a very Norman thing too, they adopt the local traditions and culture and they appeal to the locals to assimilate them into the Norman way of life, but also to add a bit of the, no the local culture into how the Normans are doing their things there. So yeah, you get this continuation of I guess it, I'm not actually sure. I can't read it very well, but I think it's mostly as close as as close as it can be to the original. Um, I think they're an offshoot of the Fatimids. So to those um, dinars that they minted in the island, you still have some form of the profession of faith on there. And then again, you basically have the same thing um, in Latin abbreviation on the reverse. So yeah, it's a very interesting coin and it sort of, for me, it shows that that way that human beings can come together and live together even through basically any period of time. Well, it goes to show the government never really cares. If you pay your taxes, you're allowed in, <laughs> at least in the Middle Ages. <laughs> Pretty much. Your tax money, you pay that, feel free to stay. 
But yeah, I agree. These are very interesting. And I know Sic or Sicily, in this era, they've got a lot of very cool coins with Frederick Barbarossa II as well. There's a lot of very interesting eagle designs where they bring back the Roman Imperial Eagle. And I think um, sort of the longer Sicily stays in the Christian world and sphere, fear of inf sphere of influence, excuse me, the more Roman iconography you see and that sort of peaks with Frederick II. Um, and I guess afterwards you have the, uh, I forget their names, the um, the dynasty I'm blanking right now, but Charles I, Charles II, the Angevins, they take over some too in Sicily. Um, and you kind of see more Latinized, more Western coins come throughout. But you're very right. This is sort of a snapshot, a window into just, I would say, the uh, quickly changing world of medieval uh, Europe. And then in particular, Italy, I think you see a lot of changing powers there, whether it's local Italians, French, uh, Byzantines, Germans or Arabs, Muslims coming in. You've got pretty much people from all over the world trying to take and stake their claim in Italy. So this is a very interesting coin, a nice little snapshot of that era. Uh, yeah, and that seems like a pretty good price, too. I think these tend to go for like two, three hundred. They're about the weight of a Tremesis at one point three two grams. So you don't have too much gold here. Uh, but that seems like a fair price still, and this seems to be a very nice one. I know a lot of times the reverse, especially, uh, can be sort of wore out and struck. They didn't have too many dies, so this seems to be uh, a nice, clear representation of that design. If we can go ahead, and yeah, I agree. Oh, I think yeah, Doctor Blaschek picked a pretty good example. He picked pretty good examples of everything. And I've got a question for you too. I don't know if you're familiar. Do you know was the reverse was that? Uh, or the obverse, excuse me, was that intentionally done? Or do you know if that was uh, an imitation left over? I am curious. I didn't realize that it was the uh, Fatima, the Declaration of Faith. Uh, it would interest me if the Normans were aware that they were putting that on a coin alongside the Christian Declaration of Faith. Because I know, although they did emphasize cross-cultural impact, that would surprise me that um, a medieval Christian ruler would have done that intentionally. It sort of reminds me of the Crusaders in Jerusalem and acre where they would entire as well where they would mint the imitation dinars and the pope actually got mad at them because they were minting these coins pretty much copying the local design uh but on that they had the fatima declaration of faith and other muslim sayings and the pope was upset that his crusading subjects were doing this but the crusaders kind of on site in the area they were focused on local relations and actually building up um those relations with local people and trying to focus on trade and harmony whereas sort of the distant popes were upset about what he saw as watering down their religion, but the locals saw as an important way to ingratiate themselves with people in the area. So I would be curious if the Sicilians made that as a conscious choice to have that on one side, or if it was more of just using a local coin design, but not being aware of what was on it. Although I suppose in that era, there's probably no way you would be unaware of what the coin said, or just in general. I think, and I'm quite certain of this, I think they knew what they were doing. And it might not have been a matter of religion, but simply a matter of practicality, because I think this is what the Crusaders found in Accra too, or just in, you know, the the Levant, when they introduced their more distinctive Crusader types that had the cross and they had the, the Arabic Kufic legend, but it was basically the Christian version of one God, one son, one baptism. Uh, they found that people were less likely, I think, I've read this before that they were less likely to accept it and yeah. undertake commerce with those. So there's a bit of a public outcry against that. And so I think it was just a matter of this is something that was already familiar there and people were used to using it. So it was more to not, not rock the boat too much, just give people something that they've been used to at this point for a few hundred years and just keep things going smoothly. Yeah, that makes sense. But overall, yeah, it's a very interesting coin and still at a good price. I know, too, with the Crusaders, part of their thinking was they actually lowered the gold percentage on their coins. They were trying to sneak those into circulation. And by, like, when they put the cross on the coin and changed the actual legend in Arabic, that was due to the Pope insisting that they couldn't use Muslim phrases. But it actually stopped their plans because they were introducing these coins at a lower gold value, but trading it at full. And they were making a profit that way. Just uh, oh, interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> Yeah. All right. The next lot we've got is lot 253. And this is a very interesting coin. It is a Follis from Justinian that the Rome mint. And that should surprise you, uh, at least in this era, before Justinian, Rome was no longer in the hands of Byzantium. It was an Ostrogothic kingdom run by Germans, most famously under Theodoric. 
Theodoric the Great. He was an Amal king who in some ways managed Italy in the style of a princeps and was seen as a great and noble king. Uh, he ruled the land with fair and just values, at least towards the end of his reign, when, quite famously, Boethius wrote his Consolations of Philosophy, uh, where he was unjustly imprisoned and pretty much, as a revenge, wrote the greatest diss track of all time, which shaped the entire um, thinking and thought of Western civilization from there on out, and became probably the second most famous book in the Middle Ages besides the Bible up until about the 1500s. His Consolations of Philosophy competed with St. Augustine in terms of just what was read the most and used the most. But this time in Italian history was quite tumultuous. tumultuous. You had the Roman Empire fall and the German groups come in and set up camp. And increasingly from Theodoric onwards, you had more and more German kings who tended to be less and less Romanized. And so you had some conflict and issues there. And part of that was a reaction, intentional movement where the German kings tried to be as Roman as possible to gain acceptance from the East from Byzantium. But when Byzantium wouldn't recognize them, they sort of as a reaction decided to go full German and decided, well, if we're not going to gain acceptance by choosing your ways, we're going to go back to our customs and be as German as possible. So you had increasing tensions in this area for a long time after that. And eventually Justinian, with the pretext of a murdered king, decided to invade. He sent his general Belisarius over, and this coin would have been minted during one of the many uh, conquests of Rome. So the city of Rome itself actually was uh, Ostrogothic, went back to the Byzantines and switched over a couple of times during the war. And I think after the Italian reconquest, the city of Rome before was sitting at maybe, I think the population was like 200,000. After the wars, it was at, at about 10,000. It saw massive population loss. Uh, pretty much the wars completely destroyed the city and both sides found themselves besieged and besieging Rome uh, at different points throughout. So this coin would have been minted at some point during that conflict when the Byzantines held Rome. I think I've seen some theories speculating they were most likely struck during the 538 initial conquests of Rome. Uh, but there's no real way to prove that. But certainly at some point during the wars between the Byzantines and Ostrogoths, these were minted. And they're very interesting because, as you can see, I don't know how familiar you are with Byzantine coins, but that style of bust on Justinian, uh, it's quite unusual. I mean, the Byzantines didn't have the best style, but you can probably tell that this looks very imitative in a sense. And it's just interesting that you kind of have these um, Byzantine coins that come out with a very Germanic style. And it sort of goes to show the impacts of the cross-cultural um, trends that were happening in the area and that the Gothic side of Italy comes through on these initial coins and Rome would remain in the Byzantine hands for about 200 years after this uh, until it increasingly became independent under the popes who eventually with the help and protection of the Franks crowned Charlemagne Holy Roman Emperor and sort of cast off the Byzantine protection they once had and went their own way to become an independent state and from that point onwards you sort of saw the rise of the papal states and independent papacy and then uh, peaking under Innocent III, you actually had a crusade led against Byzantium uh, and the uh, height of papal power, both temporal and spiritually. But overall, I thought this was a very interesting coin that sort of captures that tension in Italy at the time between the Germans and the Byzantines. It's got a lot of history behind it, and it's a Byzantine coin which shows Ostrogothic style coming through. So I thought overall, it's just a very interesting coin. They're pretty rare and tend to go for a lot. I've not checked the price here, but yeah, 260 francs. I'd guess it goes for maybe double that, maybe even a bit more. A normal Justinian Follis would probably go for about 50 to 100, depending on style, but these Italian Western mints are a lot more rare and command a large premium. And also one note, this being a full Follis in Byzantium, that would have been a frontal style bust, but here we see a side facing bust. One more interesting tidbit, but yeah, overall a pretty neat coin. Yeah, that's a very nice coin. I think this is one of the, the few Byzantine coins I actually knew something about going in. I'm actually on book six of Procopius at the moment. Ah, very so nice. he's just finished up with uh, the Siege of Rome, the 538 siege, and they're just moving on to besieging Ravenna and Rimini. So yeah, this is a very cool coin. I think it's incredible, the whole um, reconquest of the Mediterranean, making it Mare Nostrum all over again, and how it it succeeded in some aspects and failed spectacularly in the long term, but it's just, I guess it was a very, uh, I don't even know how to describe it, just it's a vanity project, but it's also recapturing a bit of that lost glory of the Roman Empire. So it is one of those shining moments in history that I guess for 
10 years, you've got this wonderful rejuvenated Roman empire. And then it sort of comes crashing down again. Yeah. Of course, with hindsight, with the Arab attacks, it would have been a lot better to save that money and focus out on the army and protection in the East. But hindsight is 2020. I don't know if you listened at all to the podcast, The History of Byzantium, but the host there, uh, he made an interesting point that he sees the history of Byzantium as sort of um, Sisyphean story. If you know the story of Sisyphus, the uh, Greek figure who always had to roll the boulder up the hill, and when he reached the top, it would roll back down, and his punishment was to roll that back up every day. Uh, no matter how hard he tried, that ball and boulder came rolling back down. And in some ways, Byzantium is just like that. I mean, you know, you had the Hunnic invasions, the West Falls, the East is in shambles. You get someone like Anastasius. He puts in economic reform, uh, revitalizes the state. They finally come back. They've got great armies, great leadership under Justinian. They can come back. They conquer back the empire, the West. It's pretty miraculous. They take Carthage in a couple weeks. Italy in a couple years, they take back Hispania, France, lots of different areas, and then the plague hits. Then you've got war out in the east, and it just seems like no matter how hard they tried, no matter how hard they push that boulder up, it always comes rolling back down. You know, you push it up to conquer back the entire empire, and then it rolls back down to the plague and the Arabs attacking. That just sort of defines the history of Byzantium. Whereas Rome, you know, it was almost an inevitable climb to the top, and then it sort of came crashing down quickly. Byzantium sort of the opposite. It's a struggle to keep going, keep fighting, expanding, declining, expanding, declining. And this is sort of maybe the peak snapshot of that, to where under Justinian, you really do have the peak of territory, but it all comes crashing back down. Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head with that, with the comparison to Sisyphus. Um, yeah, the Byzantines were a resilient lot, but they also had so many troubles. I think between, I've read this somewhere, between... Um, 110 successions that happened in the Byzantine Empire, roughly 60 or so of them were through palace coups. Yeah, it's incredible that a nation like ever. that, <laughs> it's just insane that a country like that could survive for 1100 years or 1200, average, however long. Like one violent overtake of power every 10 years is the official number in terms of coups where they overthrew someone. And that's pretty crazy if you think about it. Like one overthrow like that every 10 years and still the government was surprisingly stable. Uh, but yeah, it, it's just, it's quite interesting. I think in some sense, the idea of an emperor and the emperor themselves were quite disconnected. So you saw power struggles to where everyone believed in the idea and the office of emperor, but there wasn't much legitimacy in the actual person that was the emperor themselves. So you sort of had vying, vying factions for the office of emperorship, but no one ever actually questioned that office itself which sort of led to an odd sort of decentralized bureaucracy that was loyal to whoever was in the office, in the office itself, but not the man in the office. Or even woman in the case of Irene in a few different regions. But yeah, overall, very interesting. I thought that's a, a great coin. Lots of cool history there. Belisarius, the re a Western reconquest. You can't go better than that. Pretty cool era. And then second up here, I've chosen lot 290. I thought this stood out as an amazing coin, sort of a peak Byzantine style, you might say. It's got great strike, great style, in my opinion, and a fun design. You've got Justinian II with his son Tiberius during his second reign, struck between 705 and 711. It is a gold solidus at 20 millimeters and 4.25 grams, struck in Constantinople. And I don't know if you're familiar with the story of Justinian II at all. Oh, a little bit. Um, yeah, exiled, comes back ships nearly shipwrecked and on the way back the commanders like you know agree to forgive your enemies and maybe god will forgive us and let us um you know get through the storm safely and he's like may god strike us all down if i don't <laughs> murder my enemies yeah, yeah he <laughs> colorful had, figure he had a, a pretty tough life i think but in some ways it was his fault he was the scion of the heraclean dynasty i think he was a great great grandson of heraclius so he sort of came from a long dynasty ruling byzantium but he ruled with an iron fist, you could say. He had no patient, sort of dis patience, disregarded his generals and kind of ruled with an iron fist, which led to the people overthrowing him. He had his nose slit and he was exiled to Cherson. But like you said, he came back from power uh, with a Bulgar tribe, I think, and <clears throat> re-entered Constantinople, took the throne again. And yeah, on the way, they had a sh uh, ship stuck in a storm. And yeah, his commander said, please make a, a deal with God. If you tell God I'm gonna have mercy on my enemies, maybe he'll let us survive this. And he said, yeah. If I should even spare a single one of them, may God strike me down right now. And he came back, killed all his enemies, got to rule for a second time until he was overthrown again. But this is the interesting dynastic piece with him and his son there, Tiberius. 
both of whom were killed when he was overthrown the second time. But Justinian was Justinian the second was the first person to introduce the bust of Christ on coins. So this is actually during his second reign. The first reign is the first time he tried that out, but this is the second sort of style, uh, a more elegant, more refined portrait. You've got a bust there of Christ holding his hand up in benediction, holding the Book of Go uh, Gospels as well. And then you've got the two emperors and the reverse. But yeah, overall, I think a splendid issue, just about as nice as they come. Yeah, it's quite beautiful. I actually do personally prefer the earlier, the earlier depiction with the beard and a bit more, just feels a bit more authentic. I was going to say, yeah, but, kind of a more haggard yeah. look. Also, I'm going to grab yeah, a bit but, more coffee, so I'll be back in like 20 seconds. Sounds good. All right, I'm back. But yeah, overall, I think I agree with you there. Uh, the initial busts, they look a lot more, I think, authentic to what I would imagine Christ is like. Here, he's sort of more elegant. He's got very fine styled hair. I've actually not seen an analysis of why his hair looks like that. It's very unusual, almost like an afro. I don't know if that was a contemporary hairstyle applied to Christ. Uh, I've not seen it in any Byzantine icon, so I don't know what the inspiration for that was, but it is very unusual and gives him almost the appearance of Megamind, if you've seen that movie with a large forehead there. <laughs> yeah, kind of does look like that, doesn't it? almost wonder if it's meant to be a halo, but they just ended up giving it the curls. Yeah, it's quite interesting overall. But yeah, that's a great coin issue. Justinian II is one of the best Byzantine emperors, just in terms of an awesome story, an awesome comeback, and then an epic overthrow and fall. But yeah, that's at 900 francs right now. Honestly, I've got no idea what this will hammer for. This is really just about as nice as they come. I think the sky's the limit. I wouldn't be surprised at like three, 4,000 francs for this. Yeah, I've got no clue. But I did want to add, I think um, the other thing is with the very Christian imagery on this, it speaks to the political climate of the time. So I know with the initial um, the initial design that was trialed, I think it was in response to the uh, Umayyad Caliphate. They basically decided to get rid of their old uh, Persian and pseudo-Byzantine types and decided to move over to their new currency standard of the dinar and the dirham. And that was entirely um, just calligraphy. There was no depiction of you know anything that was alive i guess or anything other than geometry so it's just lines and circles and some calligraphy that's a very um i guess outward or direct profession of the religion of that empire and so this was basically a rebuttal of that as far as i understand it yeah with having a very christian iconography of in course, response to that you had the flip side come later on this was still during, uh, I would say, a relatively successful time in Byzantium, but you had the 717 siege where the Arabs almost took Constantinople, and in reaction to that, you had the Byzantines come up with an iconoclasm. I guess an Arab accusation made, or uh, sorry, a Muslim accusation made was that Christians were sort of um, breaking the second commandment, that they were worshiping idols through icons. So the Byzantines took that personally, and in, in the face of military loss, that came up with new coins. I'll pull one up here, but it's based on the Arabic coin. The Millerezion, I probably misspelled that. Um, but they were a coin designed from Byzantium with actually no images on them. They had the cross and words, but that was it. So you can see early coins like this, where they just had text on them, like the Arabic coins, or the Muslim coins, um, besides the cross, but that was it with iconography. Yeah, Byzantium kind oh. of had an identity crisis within that because the Arabs sort of said, we have the success of God we are winning battles, therefore we're right. We don't worship, or sorry, we don't venerate icons like you guys do. That's the Byzantine term they would use. They would say, we don't worship them, we venerate them. But there was sort of a big debate about the role of icons in religion. And the Christians sort of took that to heart and wondered, well, are the Arabs right? We've lost Egypt, we've lost Palestine, we've lost parts of Anatolia, we've lost Africa, we've lost Spain. Uh, like maybe there's some validity here. Why are we losing all these battles? Could the Arabs be right? Could it be that we're actually worshiping icons and we shouldn't be? So you actually had some iconoclast dynasties come through and they had military success. And so that was sort of seen as a sign from God that icons are bad. So temporarily icons and images and coins were taken away on these Millerezions. And it was just the cross and just texts like the Arabic coins. Eventually, 
the iconophiles, the lover of icons, would come back to power and officially decree that icons are fine and allowed in Orthodox religion. Uh, and that's why you see this uh, in Orthodox Christianity today, a large um, icon cult is the wrong word, but there's, there's lots of veneration for icon and lots of icon usage, more so than in any other denomination. And part of that traces all the way back to the 700s and the conflicts with the Arabs, where uh, in reaction to Byzantine iconoclasm, the hatred of icons, they definitively said, no, we love our icons, we're going to have icons in service. So this coin kind of serves as a brief snapshot of, you might say, um, Byzantine, Byzantine feelings of inferiority to the Arabs, that they thought, well, the Arabs might have a point that we are worshipping icons, and therefore we're going to get rid of them and only use uh, text on our coins besides the cross. So they're just an interesting tidbit here. Uh, but you're right, Justinian here, this is a coin about 20 years before all that happened. So this is sort of the one side of the pendulum of we're going to go full Christian iconography depictions of Christ on our coins to where 20 years later they would go the opposite direction and only have the cross. That is very interesting. Yeah, I read a bit about icon, the iconoclasm and all of that before, but I had no idea that the Miliarezion was connected to it that way. Yeah, that's yeah, very cool. It was sort of a Byzantine embarrassment. Because uh, you've got to think, I mean, just 200 years before, they literally ruled the entire Mediterranean. What had they done? Uh, the way they would have seen it, what have we done to lose the displeasure of God or to gain the displeasure of God? Why has he turned on us? And sort of those um, Muslim points about icons sort of hit home. And a lot of Byzantines did wonder, are they right? Could it be because we worship icons? Are we breaking the second commandment? Is that why God has left and taken his favor away from us? So you, you saw lots of tension there in Byzantium. Yeah, overall, uh, an interesting time, an interesting coin here as well. And I'll be curious to see what that goes for. Uh, the next coin I thought was kind of interesting. It is a coin die, but it's an imitation design. So it's not an actual official Byzantine die, of which I'm not sure if any exist. I know Roma Numismatic sold one a while back, but I think that might have been of dubious authenticity. So I'm not sure if any confirmed die is known. But this is kind of unusual in that it's an, a coin die, but it's an imitation uh, of a class A2 Fallis. So I forget the uh, reverse design of the official coin. I think it would have said, um, like, um, Jesus Christ, King of all kings, uh, like Basileos, Basileum, something like that. I forget the exact wording, but it would have been something along those lines. Uh, an anonymous coin struck with the bust of Christ on the obverse and on the reverse, a legend that read Christ, who is the King of all kings. But this is an imitation of that in a die that survived. And I'm not sure of the authenticity of this piece, but I thought it was interesting enough to bring up and show. Yeah, that's actually, it's quite cool. Um, I almost thought it looked Kufic to me, the, um, the indentation. It looks almost like the Shahada flipped backwards. Yeah, it, it could be, I don't know. Uh, Loy labeled it as such. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty interesting overall. Yeah, absolutely. You don't see many coin dies. I'd actually be interested. Would have been nice if they tried to uh, make something out of some plaster or some clay just to show us what it was, what the actual design was. That would have been really nifty. Yeah, I agree. But I just thought it was kind of interesting. I mean, if it does end up being like a, a Muslim die, that would be very interesting. I don't know if many of those survive, but in terms of Byzantine dies. Uh, it's just something you don't see. So I thought it was kind of unusual that not only is it a die that survived, but it's also an imitation. Uh, just in my opinion, a little bit of a red flag. Very unusual, but interesting. I guess the bidders don't agree with me. It's already at a thousand francs. And once again, who knows <laughs> what this hammer's for? I'd guess maybe four or five thousand. Yeah, it's not impossible. I've seen Roman ones go for well over fifteen, twenty thousand, so. Yeah, but an interesting piece. And. Yeah, I'd be curious if there's ever going to be an article written on it, because I'd love to kind of hear from a, just a numismatic perspective, thoughts on this. Yeah, it just looks to me, it looks so much like um, the Seljuks in Anatolia. Mm -hmm. It has the exact same, the same sort of geometric design at the top, it looks like, with the little floral yeah. embellishment. And then the style of it just looks so much like Kufic to me like specifically Seljuk Kufic. I wonder if you couldn't invert the image and see if you could read it that way. Yeah, it might be, might be a project. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> of course, that could add a lot of value. I'm not sure if there's a lot of those dies, but if it does turn out to be a certain issue from the Seljuks, 
I think that would be very interesting. But yeah, overall, just I I would just say a weird piece. It's just very odd, very unusual that number one, a die survived, and number two, if it is an imitation die, that just seems crazy to me. But yeah, I'll just be curious. I'll keep an eye on this just to see what it sells for and maybe if there's ever going to be an article written on it or a discussion somewhere. Yeah, this is where provenance would be nice, but it's an unfortunate um, truth of the numismatic game, I guess. Yeah. Don't always get that. Yeah, fine side too. Uh, this is one that I'm going to be watching. It's a trachy from John Kaminas Dukas from uh, his time as Emperor of Thessalonica, where he ruled from 1237 to 1244. It's 16 millimeters and 0 0.83 grams. Uh, there's a lot of debate about these coins. We don't actually know who minted them. So during his reign, he sort of, at least the theory is the longer he reigned, the more unusual designs he produced. Uh, but in terms of just the proliferation of designs that he came out with, I think he had just about 50 something different designs in his five year reign, whereas most Byzantine emperors introduced one design per year. So it was a huge anomaly, anomaly in terms of how many designs he introduced during his reign. And we're not sure if he actually made all of these or some theories speculate that Bulgarians or Venetian traders later on, that they minted different types in his name because a lot of his coins are very Western in nature. This one in particular, it's the emperor holding a flag standard, a military banner with two crosses inside uh, and a wing on the obverse that's kind of worn down. But it's just overall, a, something you wouldn't normally see on a Byzantine coin. So there's a lot of speculation about these if they weren't actually minted by the Byzantines or Bulgarians or some sort of anonymous entity who used the cover of John to mint these coins and use them in trade. And they're also, they tend to be very small and very uh, underweight. So there's a lot of thought too that these were used to sort of cheat customers out and maybe spend a small coin uh, with your customer thinking it was a large one and try to avoid clipping as well. Just kind of an, an interesting anomaly in that uh, you see a lot of Western designs and a lot of different coins coming out in a very brief period that is uh, at odds with other Byzantine emperors minting. So we're not really sure exactly why this happened, when, or even how, but just a very interesting ruler with lots of different types uh, and an interesting type as well here. Yeah, it's a very cool coin. It's unlike any of the trachies I've seen you share before. So good luck with that. Yeah, I'm not, And it is actually, how for. much is a normal trachy weigh? This seems so uh, light. Yeah, yeah, this is a small module, so we're not sure if they were meant to sort of deceive people in trade or if they were minted small so you couldn't clip them because there were a lot of issues of different people coming in and clipping a full module trachea to a small size. Uh, you actually, you had different modules, so you might have, I think large modules were technically almost five grams, intermediate module like 1.5 to 2.5, and these third small modules at about 0 0.5 to 0 0.8. So it kind of depends on which module you're looking at. Uh, and we're not even sure if the module system is accurate, if there's actually even a distinction in those coins that were made. But you actually see different size dies struck on coins, the same design, but smaller and smaller dies. So there seems to be some sort of implication of an official mint action that made smaller coins for whatever reason. I guess small change. Uh, yeah, very cool. Yeah. yeah, overall an interesting coin. And then last but not least, I thought this was pretty interesting. It's a silver trachy of Theodore I, Comenus Lascaris, from the Empire of Nicaea. So this was pretty much the first coin type struck by the Empire in exile after the 1204 sack, struck in Magnesia. And these are beautiful coins. I've got one myself. Um, not quite this nice, I'd say, but it's a decent coin, the one I have. But this is pretty much has a phenomenal strike on both sides. A little bit of doubling on the reverse, which kind of cuts out St. Theodore. But overall, great details, great strike. Uh, an interesting type, too, where the emperors depicted very militarily. You can see he's holding a sword here, uh, which is sort of a reaction to the 1204 events that the emperors now in their propaganda depicted themselves as victorious and able to protect their people with military means, whereas before you wouldn't have seen that on a coin very often. It does become very commonplace, though, from here on out. Wow, that is just, that's incredibly nice. <laughs> yeah, a great strike, pretty much full legend besides the one part where it was doubling. Uh, you can see it's got that interesting star staff, where it's got an eight-sided eight star in the top. Just a cool type overall. 
Uh, and these are technically electrum. I think they, they put it silver here, but a lot of the tests show that they're about five to 10% gold. So a lot of times what you might interpret as toning is actually parts of that gold coming through. So it's not actually, I mean, it could be old collection toning, but it could also be part of that electrum coming through. I see. So this have been a watered down version of the gold, the golden or yeah. electrum trachies then? Yeah, they were, I think they technically should have had more gold than they did, but uh, I think they were remnants of the trichphalion, which was, I think, one part gold, and then um, it was like one part gold, or one third gold, two thirds silver, and a bit of copper mixed together. I think this would have been a leftover of that, but they almost tended to be pure silver for whatever reason, and we don't really know why, but from here on out, they actually started minting silver trachy coins um, instead of the trichphalion, so pretty interesting for whatever reason they decided to go for silver and I think in the era too you had a lot more silver mines being discovered you see especially in places like Italy Venice France even England there's a lot more silver coinage around the 11th 12th 13th centuries and before so it seems to be that for whatever reason there was an uptick in silver in the world economy at that time yeah I think you're right about that and it continues into especially German coins in the 1500s, you get this massive explosion. Everything's now a one ounce taller. <laughs> but yeah, overall an interesting coin, I thought. Uh, as for price, I don't know. This is a pretty nice example. I'd say maybe up to like seven, 800 is fair. But kind of with that doubling on St. Theodore, I don't know if that sort of loses eye appeal, where he's kind of got a messed up head and <laughs> one leg, a little body. But overall, it's a nice coin, I think. But yeah, that just about concludes our review of the Loy Numismatic Sale. I think it's a great auction. We don't have the time, sadly, to go into depth, but I think there's over 5,000 coins in total, just about, maybe 4,000. But they've got ancient, medieval, and modern. I'd recommend anyone who enjoyed this video to not only subscribe to the channel, but also to check out the sale and see if anything there interests you. And Antoine, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to come on here and join me and talk about some coins. It's always a pleasure. Ah, oh, thank you. It's been my pleasure. Really enjoyed doing this. Yeah. Yeah, well, thanks for coming on, and we will see everyone in the audience at some point soon. Thanks. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comments, and goodbye.